Hey everybody, this is Eric Mueller, the host of The Eric Mueller Show. You're tuned in to the podcast that explores what makes any successful person's inner clock tick by unlocking the most impactful tools within their success portfolio. Cancel culture is an insidious force today. In the seconds it takes to make one regrettable social media post or wind up on the wrong side of a false accusation or misunderstanding, reputations, relationships, and careers are destroyed. I'm joined today by Evan Neerman, author of The Cancel Culture Curse and founder of Red Banyan, an international crisis management and public relations firm. Let's head on over to the interview. Evan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Excited to get into it today. I'm excited too, man. I think this is a this is a topic that really is, you know, it's like kind of a buzz term in in today's world and you know, you probably hear cancel culture on social media. But before we we dive deep into this entrepreneurial story of yours and really the expertise you have in the communication space and, and cancel culture, we want to know what makes up your success portfolio. So if you're new to this show, real quick background on how to view this is to think of an investment portfolio. Think of those things that you invest in that build that financial future for you, built toward your financial goals. Well, here on the Eric Mueller Show, I really want to discover how successful people like Evan invest in themselves and build that foundation for their success. So Evan, start us off here. What are some skills or traits, habits or mindsets that make up that success portfolio for you? Yeah, well, it's, it's a great question. And I think there are a number of them. So I'll just kind of start. And then if you find you want to go down any of those rabbit holes, we, we can go further. But I'll, I'll tell you a handful that come to mind immediately. And, and first and foremost is intellectual curiosity, wanting to ask why, having varied interests, being willing to learn. That to me is fundamental to entrepreneurial success. Because without that, you're going to be willing to just accept whatever people have told you or whatever your parents think you should do or your friends or whomever. And so I think having the willingness to open up your mind and always be curious, that serves you really well. Two, this is a lost art, but I think people need to read and read actual, brace yourself, books, not just watch clips on YouTube and not just do blinkist and get the quick and dirty. I think you actually value you you find tremendous value when you invest the time in going deep on certain subjects and I think reading and reading books on a variety of subjects is a great way. Uh, yes, you should listen to podcasts, you should read blogs, you should read the news, all those different things, magazines, online sites, Reddit, you name it. But there's something unique about going deep with a book. And I think it's people don't pay attention to it anymore, but they should. Another is lack of fear and conquering a fear mindset. Because in my experience, and I've been been at this quite a long time throughout my career and 12 years as the owner of my own business, the, the biggest drawback to your success is you. And it's these limiting thoughts and these self doubts that can really be the divider between just doing okay and doing amazingly well and exceeding expectations. And so whenever I get into a situation where I feel like the business is kind of not exciting to me in the moment or you know, sales are flat over a couple of weeks or months, or I'm dealing with a, a difficult personnel issue. I always come back to, it's all about what's between the ears and the mindset and the mentality of the entrepreneur. And then an, another couple of quick things is I, I think who you surround yourself with and who you learn from as your mentor, as your friend, as your peer support group is vital. I've been lucky because I found a group through called Entrepreneurs Organization, where it's a community of founders who all help each other with our businesses. And we're, we're there not to solicit one another. In fact, there's a prohibition on soliciting. You're not allowed to ask anybody for business. You can't sell them anything. So you've got this safe community where everyone is in it just to help others. 
And the more you give, the more you receive. And that's been a foundation to my own success, both in on the business and personal, spiritual, mental, et cetera. And the last thing that I'll just touch upon is physical health. If you're not taking care of your body and you're not getting adequate sleep, if you're eating crappy food as opposed to healthful, good, nutritious food, protein, vegetables, natural things, if you're eating a bunch of prepackaged garbage and you're you're partying too much or you're abusing your body, you're not living the life that will get you to where you want to go. Because at the end of the day, your health, in my view, is everything. You can be the richest guy in the world and have crappy health and you're not rich at all. You may be rich on paper, but your quality of life is no good and you're not really wealthy. So I think if someone is serious about taking their business to the next level or serious about reaching their potential in in their financial goals, their personal goals, their economic pursuits, their career. If you don't take care of yourself first and you don't take care of your health, what's the point? Because then when you get to all those new levels where you should feel enriched and happy, you're, if your body's breaking down and you don't feel well, What's the point? Right. Yeah, Evan, I, I think, I mean, that. yeah, that, that's fantastic. I, I hope that, I hope that everyone listening is, is may, hopefully you're not feeling like, you know, that you're doing too much wrong. Cause I, I certainly, you know, hearing when you hear someone talk about their success portfolio, I think it's, at least for me, you know, just being fully transparent, I, I feel like, I'm like, gosh, you know, there's so much more I could be doing or like, you know, just that, that element of like sleep right there. Like, I know I could get more sleep. I know I could you know, eat better. So I'm sure a lot of people listening feel similarly. And it's not to discourage, but rather motivate. Like there's you, your, your potential is like untapped in, in a way. And so I think the things that Evan just shared right there, I, I, I really gravitate towards, you know, that intellectual curiosity. I, I think that's something a lot of, you know, a lot of people that, that I know have that, that bug where they just want to continually learn. And books is, is something that every time I've picked up a book and read it, you know, cover to cover, end to end, I always leave that experience thinking like, I should do more of this. I should, I should lean into this more. And it's, I don't know, I, maybe it's a time thing, but it's, it's hard to, I guess, sit down and, and read where I think, oh, there's another thing I could be doing where, you know, so I guess just making the time of it. I mean, have you found that, has it gotten easier for you throughout your life to, to make time for things like that or like your physical health or, you know, keeping, keeping kind of, you know, the balance of, of keeping Evan physically, mentally, and you know, emotionally sound. Have you found that to become easier, harder, the same as you've gone throughout your life? Well, the physical, I don't even think about because for me, exercise and a healthy lifestyle isn't something that waxes and wanes or comes and goes. It's a foundational pillar in my life. And so from the age of seven, when I kind of got into soccer all the way to where I am now, which is 45, there. I, I've never gone through a period where I didn't take care of my health. I had a period where I didn't have the choice and I, I had a back injury and I had to have ultimately surgery, which put me out of out of commission for a while, but I'm fully rec recovered now and recuperated. But th there's never been a time in my life where I wasn't willing to invest in physical health. So that for me, I don't even think about it. Just It's like making my bed. It's automatic. Reading, making time for that, Look, when I was young, it was a passion. And so I would, I, I remember being in high school, like I loved the weekend, not so I could go out. And, yeah, I like to go out and party and drink some beers with friends and, you know, get into trouble a little bit like most red blooded Americans do. Um, but I always enjoyed having time to sit and read. And so that, that, has not changed that much. How I read now is different because I have a lot less time than I used to. And so for me, even though I'm talking about the value of books, it doesn't mean you have to consume them sitting down and reading them. In fact, I, I consume at least half, if not more of the books that I read on a monthly basis on Audible. And I actually speed up the narration's uh, speed so that I can get more in, in a shorter amount of time. So there are these little hacks. I mean, there's so much information out there, people telling you, how can you make sure that you read more? How can you, regardless of what your goal is, there's always time you can make time. And, and there's this one little cartoon and it seems crazy, but I, I think to me, like 
this thing, when I saw it, it resonated with me and I, I come back to it. And I was at the doctor's office and there's this little like clipping that one of their employees had put on the wall and it's a doctor standing there and there's this overweight middle-aged guy. And he's like, what fits better into your busy schedule, Mr. Johnson, exercising an hour a day or being dead 24 hours a day? And that kind of captures it. So I think as you move up in your journey and you move through your journey and you get to higher levels of success and whether you're ascending to a higher level, you get a promotion within a company or you're starting your own side hustle or side gig or you're building an enterprise, you have to become more militant about protecting your time because time really does become a commodity that you can't part with easily. And so maximizing time and becoming more efficient, I think, uh, becomes really more and more important as you go. So, yeah, I, I think that that's probably rings true for a lot of people out there hearing that, like that time management aspect is, is, you know, you get that same 24 hours in the day as everyone else. And it's, you know, if you dedicate a certain amount of sleep, then, you know, okay, you got a traditional job, you dedicate hours to that. So it's like you fill up, you know, an hour to physically, you know, exert yourself and get to get some exercise. So you can kind of, you know, think about wh where your time can go later that, you know, could you be more productive in certain areas? And, you know, you got to re rest and recharge, obviously, as well to keep yourself, you know, sane. But yeah, I think a, a lot to unpack there, Evan. I, I think one question I certainly didn't want to forget to ask was, do you have a, a book recommendation? Obviously, we're going to say The Cancel Culture Curse is a phenomenal book, and we'll tag that in the show notes to read that. But also... You know, my first yeah. book, Crisis Averted, is truly a must read for everyone. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so aside from those two, what's the third best book that, that you've read? Okay, well, there, it's hard to pick just one, but I'm going to tell you the one that I'm reading right now, which I come back to. I read it at least once a year. And when I say read, again, I went for a walk this morning. I lived in in Florida. It was a cool morning, which is unusual. I went out for a walk and I was I was just enjoying the quiet time in the morning. And I decided this morning, because I, I have the same struggles that you were talking about, all of us having, you know, can I be doing more? Should I be doing more? Being too hard on myself, feeling like, oh, I've got all these areas where I need to improve. Why am I not where I need to be? And I felt like you know, I was struggling with that myself this morning. And I said, you know what? It, go back to your North Star, which is some of the concepts that are in an amazing book called The Big Leap. The author is, is Gay Hendricks. It's not a business book. It is a self-help psychology book. And, and the book is incredible because it's filled with these really amazing insights among them, it talks about time management, which you were just touching upon, and how to maximize your time, how to think about your time. It also includes some really interesting thoughts about considering the activities in your life that deliver the highest value to you. And what does it mean to live in a zone of incompetence versus a zone of competence versus a zone of genius, which I think is where we all really want to get to. And perhaps most importantly, you know, I talked at the beginning of this conversation about getting the mental game right, which is, I think, essential for all aspiring, hungry, young professionals. The mental game is everything. And one of the concepts that's explored in this book is something that, that he calls, um, oh my gosh, it just jumped out of my mind, but it's, it's, um, Oh my gosh, what does he call it? And I'm I'm in the middle of the book. Um, anyway, I'll describe it and then it's gonna pop into my head exactly <laughs> how he brands it. For sure. Um, but it's it's basically we limit ourselves. Here it is. It's called the upper limit problem. That's what he terms it. And the the concept is we come pre-programmed and our childhood and the experiences we have in our youth teaches us where we feel comfortable and where we feel uncomfortable and that all these things happen in our lives that inner that impact a thermostat setting if you will and that what happens to most people is when you start to get too hot and you start to get to new levels of success 
in financial success or health or reaching a good place in your relationships, whatever it may be, when you start to get up there and things are going really well, we self-sabotage. We do things to, to tell ourselves, I don't deserve to feel this happy, this inspired, this energized. Therefore, we let worry thoughts come. We, we stress about things that we shouldn't be stressing about. We tell ourselves stories to bring ourselves back down because we tend to be more comfortable feeling under pressure, or under fire, as opposed to opening ourselves up and being willing to say, you know what? I do deserve to feel amazing all the time and to be grateful and to be filled with this positivity. And so we we need to recalibrate our thinking and we need to get our minds right in opening ourselves up to this idea that if we do start to have self-doubts and we do start to feel negative thoughts creeping in, it's probably our upper limit problem kicking in and we have to beat that back with a vengeance. So I would say that book, The Big Leap, changed my life. I recommend it to people all the time. And I don't, I, I'm practicing what I preach. And I was not feeling great the last couple of days. And I just went for a walk. And that was the book I came back to. That's really inspiring, Evan. I, I really like that. And I think, I mean, consider it added to my list. I, I, I like the audiobook aspect too. You know, it's able to, able to, you know, kind of fit that more into a, to a, to a day, or if you want to go out and walk, you obviously don't want to hold a book probably and walk. And, you know, it's a, it makes more sense not, to do that. Not so advisable. it's not it advisable. No. Walk when you walk out in front of a car or a truck, especially That's right. they're going to be on their own phones. So you're, yeah, you're, you're both, you're both looking at something other than where you're going. And so, and I think that honestly, that, that out, that also brings up a point of, of where are you going? And another piece of the success portfolio that I like to explore is what is success? Where, where are you going? Where's the destination that you want to reach? And so you, you shared, you know, really a perfect way to set yourself up to be successful and win the day with those qualities and traits you shared and those habits that you've built in. And when you think about success, Evan, what, what is it to you? What do, what do you believe success means and how do you know that you've achieved it? And I, I guess maybe how has that changed for you over time or, or has it remained the same? Well, it definitely hasn't remained the same because every time that I set a target or a goal, I get there. And then I need to expand my definition and I need to think bigger. And I think when I look at, at my journey on the business and entrepreneurial side, I'm continuously having to tell myself, think bigger, think bigger, because what you set out to achieve, if you're dedicated and you're disciplined, you'll get there. And then you'll need to constantly evolve that. So look, I know exactly for me, what success looks like because I have it literally written in a document and it is my life goals. And in that document, I articulate all the most important aspects of my life and what I want to accomplish. So I don't live my life by accident. I live my life by design and I know where I want to go. And it includes how I want to be as a father, how I want to show up as a friend, what I want to be as a leader, what are the business goals I want to set, what's the impact I want to have on my community. I talk about my health goals and my nutrition goals. I talk about all of it in this one, one pager. It's all right there. So I'm very clear about what success will look like. And, you know, hopefully I'm going to get to the end of my life, which God willing, as many years from now, and I'll be able to look at that checklist and I want to be able to have accomplished at least a lot of them. I don't expect to accomplish all of them because if I do, that means that I've set the goals too low. And so I will be perfectly happy if I get 80% of the things on that list. If I, if I do 80% of those things that are on my target list for my life, I will have had not a good life, not a great life, but an, an exceptional life. And I think other than really putting down what it is you're, you're being intentional about, I think when it comes to business goals, there are all these methodologies about there about how to build, grow, scale a business. And there's all these different folks who are telling you that they can get you there and hire them as a consultant or buy their program. At the end of the day, it's actually quite simple. You have to have a vision of where you want to get to. 
And then you just reverse engineer how to get there. And for me, in my business, what that means is setting really a three-year horizon. I, I think it's hard to go any further than that because the world just goes too fast at this point. And who you are today and your situation could be vastly different five years from now. So for me, three years is the right number. And I have a what I call a painted picture of where I expect to be in three years. And I write it in the present tense so I can manifest it. I write it as if it's a foregone conclusion in the same way that Michael Phelps and other Olympic athletes, they visualize over and over and over again what it's going to feel like when they accomplish that athletic feat, when they're standing on the podium, getting their gold medal. I take the three-year, I then set annual targets. My team and I break those down into quarterly. We check on the progress on a weekly basis, and then we get together as a team on a, on a daily basis. And so that cadence and that mindset of if you set your goal and then you just reverse engineer how to do it, and you're willing to hold yourself accountable and check in on your progress, if you do that, it's not brain surgery. Like That is a recipe to success, regardless of your industry, regardless of your business, regardless of your life goals. It's actually pretty simple. The challenge is 99% of people don't have the discipline to stick with it. Yeah. And that, and that's, you know, somewhat of a harsh reality of, you know, what it takes to get to a certain level of success or to achieve anything that's meaningful in regarding, you know, in regard to a goal. And so having, having the discipline, I, I think I read something the other day about discipline and I can't recall, I think it might've been on Instagram, but it was discipline is, is having the ability to do the things you need to do when you don't want to do them. And so that, that kind of hit home. I, I see things throughout my day that, that hit, hits me. I mean, in talking with you today, I mean, it's, you know, there's certain aspects that, that hit me and make me think like, you know, it, it really is that simple. At the same time, you, you get, you have those self-doubt, those self-limiting talks that those stories you tell yourself, I think that's, it's something that I think everybody listening, you have to experience that on a day-to-day -day basis where you think, I'm going to do this, but then you have a thought of, but what if this happens? Or <laughs> what if it's like, you, you, why, do you, why do we trap ourselves in these cycles of, of thinking, you know, the, the reasons why it won't work versus the reasons why it will work? And one of my parents listen to this, they're going to they're gonna laugh and say, we've told you this literally several thousand times. <laughs> and when you were mentioning your success portfolio, Evan, I have to mention something my mom recently told me, and I believe it, it is true and I haven't gotten there yet, but she was saying that, that morning routines help you mentally prepare for your day. And I know that I haven't locked in a full mental routine yet that is getting me there. And I've got kind of a variable work schedule with days and evenings, so I'm not you know, getting up at the same time or going to bed at the same time yet. But I think that's something I probably could do even in this current state. Hey, do you have a morning you. routine? Yeah, I, I want to hear uh, that excuse you just gave. I'm going to challenge you on that one. You absolutely. Your mom is right, Eric. Listen to your mother, for God's sake. Dang it, I know. <laughs> you have no excuse. What do you mean? You can have a simple morning routine and you can do it no matter what. That's an excuse. It's a lie you're telling yourself. So I'm not going to let you get away with it live on your podcast. Well, I think that's I think that's fair, Evan, because I think if I had to say what is my morning routine, I mean, I do have I do have pieces that I do consistently. This morning, I, I made my pot of coffee. I do that pretty much every morning. S some days I go for a run in the morning. Some days I don't until I get home from work. So I guess it's it's kind of you know thinking about the the aspects that that could be more consistent. I think I think maybe giving myself a little grace too to know what 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 are you already doing. Don't set it up for you know. Oh, you're falling short on this already because you probably are doing things that are in somewhat of a routine. Maybe you just want to ramp it up. Maybe you don't want to be stuck at that upper limit of I could do more. Maybe incorporating something like your, uh, you know, audiobook thing into the daily routine would would help. We're listening to. I have a question for you. Yeah. Do you make Do you make your bed every morning? I would say I would say not every morning. Most mornings. Okay, so here's here's something that I think will actually change your life. And that is if you start making your bed every single morning, my prediction is you will have a better morning every morning and you will set your day up for success. And here's why. Our brains are hardwired to want to accomplish things and to have that dopamine hit of getting something, you know, think of a checklist. When you've got your things on the checklist and you draw that line through the item or you check it off. You get that hit of dopamine. Yeah, I did what I said I was going to do. You set a goal and you accomplish it. You're like, damn, I feel great. 
I actually think making your bed is one of the easiest and most important ways to start your day right. And I'm not the only one who who believes this. In fact, I'm I'm you know, they say that R&D is supposed to mean research and development. I actually think it means rip off and duplicate because there aren't that many original thoughts out there anymore. We 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 kind of come up with most things have been considered before. They're just it's hard to find them because everybody's talking and it's all out there. But there was an amazing speech that was given to the uh, comment at the commencement of the University of Texas, and I, th- I think the speaker was Admiral McRaven, who used to oversee all of the special forces in the U.S. military, and he talks about the value of making your bed. And then he ended up writing this little book, which is a cool book and worth reading too, about make your bed. And make your bed basically says, when I get out of bed in the morning, when I start my day, I am going to have a consistent thing that I do every morning. And then you you can tick it off the list. You've accomplished it. And so having the discipline to do that every morning, not some mornings, not most, like every day, you start your day with a win. And so to me, that is a, a I make my bed every morning. I even make my bed every morning when I'm staying in a hotel, which is a lot. I make it. Yeah, the maids can come and they can, or the housekeepers may come and freshen up the room, but I make the bed every day. And so I I think here's a simple life hack to anyone who's listening. You want to make your day better, make your bed every single day. And you'll be surprised how much that sets the tone for the rest of your day. Well, I think I, I have heard that that Admiral's speech and I've seen, you know, the, you know, heard about the book and whatnot, but I haven't committed to doing that and, and making that a habit. So I think today, today's the 28th of November, the day of recording. This is going to release later, but tw- to, uh, Wednesday, November 29th, that's going to be the start, Evan. I'm going to start that. And if I fall, if I, if I think I'm going to not do it, or if I almost don't make it and I go, you know, try to do something else, I'll think back to this conversation and that'll motivate me to like, nope, nope, can't do that. Got to go back and make that bed. So I, I think it. that's, I think that's great. I think that's a great way to you know, just start, you know, starting small with the habits too. Another book that a lot of people like is Atomic Habits. And it's, I think there's so many small pieces that you can do to build towards your goals. So you mentioned, you know, thinking in the future where you want to go reverse engineer that there's a lot of micro steps that along the way, they're going to get you to that goal. And it's all about just being disciplined and putting in the effort to do what you can do now. And like your three-year vision, you know, you, you've already set that into, into reality. There's, one other book that I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention is, is Think and Grow Rich. And it's got a little bit different angle on, you know, it's, it's manifesting wealth and manifesting, you know, financial success. But that thought process can be applied to, to really anything. And that book does say that you, you basically speak into reality what is already going to happen. And your mind is already there. And then it's just a matter of your physical actions will catch up with it. If your mind's already in that place, it's just a matter of time before you reach it. And so, I think that that really kind of ties perfectly into really everything we talked about with the, with regard to your success portfolio and how you define success. So we could maybe switch gears a little bit and get into that cancel culture piece and really kind of talk about your niche expertise area with Red Banyan and and you know kind of your views on it because like I mentioned at the beginning here Evan cancel culture is kind of in my opinion like kind of that buzz terminology where people throw it around a lot of people probably think what they you know might define it as but Specifically, what what is your view on cancel culture? How is it affecting the society? What what would be the maybe the simple way to define it for you? Just kind of enlighten us, Evan, a little bit. Share share with us what your thoughts are. Yeah, absolutely. And look, I'll give you the academic definition from my book, and then I'll I'll break it down in a little bit more of a way that people could actually understand and and think about. So the academic definition is the use of intimidation by a morally absolute coalition to isolate and disproportionately punish an alleged transgressor. So that's a lot. It's a mouthful. Um, I wrote the book, The Cancel Culture Curse, because I wanted to combat cancel culture. And I think the before you can combat it, you first have to define it. So the book was actually the first formal definition of what actually cancel culture is. And a more sort of layman's terms definition of cancel culture is cancel culture is is this thing that happens when a group of people gang up on and try to cancel or attack someone 
because they've done something that is deemed to be unacceptable in the eyes of the mob. That's really it. And so you see this manifesting itself in both a grand scale when you're talking about celebrities, comedians, musicians, people getting canceled. You see it also happening to small and medium businesses and private individuals. And the reason that I wrote the book is because you know I don't write books for a living. I've already told you I, I love to read, and so obviously I, I you know, I, I enjoy books. I enjoy learning, and I enjoy ideas. And so, books, writing books, is a way to share my ideas with the world and to sort of leave that legacy also um, behind, so that I can try to impact and open people's thoughts um, to and and make cases for things that I think are important. So I, I wrote this book as a passion project. I do high stakes and crisis PR for a living. I'm a crisis manager. My firm does both proactive, positive PR. And at Red Banyan, we also specialize in high stakes, um, high stakes communications. So positive on one side, get me in the press, crisis management, get me the hell out of the press as a way to think of it. And I was seeing in the last couple of years, this remarkable uptick in the utter destruction of people's lives, their businesses and their personal lives by gangs of people who don't even know them, attacking them, usually first on social media, then it makes the leap into mainstream press. And then before you know it, someone's entire life is in tatters. And I think that's wrong. I think we all make mistakes. Lord knows I make mistakes probably on a daily basis. And we have to be willing to forgive other people when they make a misstep. And we can't make all punishments permanent. And that's really what cancel culture is. It's it's an attempt to say to someone, you've done something that I don't like, and therefore I'm going to ruin your life. I'm not just going to hold you accountable for what you've done or you've said or this bad moment that you've had, but I am going to set out on a mission to destroy you. And I think it's it's fundamentally cruel. It's it's un-American because it violates certain core principles upon which our country was founded. And I think it has to stop. And so that's really, Eric, why I wrote the book. And if, you know, in a nutshell, my message is I wrote, I wrote a book that defines cancel culture and makes the case that this is a curse, that it's something we have to stop seeing in our society. And and the sooner we get rid of cancel culture, the better it's going to be for everyone. Yeah, I think, and, and you shared with me, a, you know, a really detailed breakdown of, of chapter by chapter, you know, the key points in the book. And without, you know, completely ruining the book, I think that, you know, that element of, of un-American, the opposite of American values, I think that was a piece that, that I thought was interesting to, to hear about. You mentioned that, you know, it's, it's not holding some, it's not the, it's not to not hold someone accountable for their actions. You just don't want to irreparably harm their reputation and not give them a, a chance to, you know, explain themselves, or I think it's, it kind of like bottlenecks and pigeonholes someone into, into a space. And the thing, the thing that I think and worries me about the cancel culture, you know, curse basically is, you know, that free speech aspect. If we are afraid, and we talked a little bit about fear earlier in a kind of a different context, but if we're afraid to share our, our true beliefs and opinions, that's a real problem. That's, that's, you know, we're, we're not heading in the right direction then as a country or, or a world. And so with, with this type of phenomena, what, what, is the, what is the real problem with it in regard to free speech? I mean, how, how are we able to combat that? If you have a client that comes to you and they genuinely believe what they said, but it's going to ruin their reputation if they stick by it, how do we handle that situation? It's just, to, to me, it's like, it's kind of, it seems like a zero sum game in, in some way. It is. And unfortunately, if you want to survive in, in business right now, you have to be careful and you can't afford to do or say everything that pops into your mind or even be 100% open about what you believe because at the end of the day there is a critical mass of people who are going to disagree with you you know i i could tell you i think your hat looks great and there are a lot of people out there who are going to tell say you know what evan is clearly an idiot because it's an ugly hat what kind of self-respecting podcast host wears a purple and white hat? It looks awful. So 
that you're never going to satisfy everyone. The problem is we believe in certain core things in this country. We believe in that people should have the right to form their own opinions. We believe that people should have the right to free speech. I mean, this is that's the first amendment. Okay. It's not just like down the list. It's not even two or three. It's the first. We believe that people should have the right to express themselves. We believe as Americans that there should be a competing marketplace of ideas and that people, regardless of where they fall on the political spectrum, they should be able to express those ideas publicly without fear, fear from the government silencing them, fear from not being able to do it because we as Americans believe we do have the right to freedom of expression and freedom of, of choice and religion. So the other thing is we also believe as Americans in this thing called due process. And our entire society is built upon the idea that there is a justice system. And so there are laws. We have to uh, adhere to laws. And if people violate the law, the consequence and the expectation is if you, if you break the law, you're going to receive a punishment for it. And you, there's going, but the punishment has to fit the crime. So where I think cancel culture goes awry is in a judicial context, due process. If if you're accused of doing something, I, I heard that you uh, we're, we're going to say you stole something from the local supermarket the last time you went there. OK, if you did and we we all know you would never do that because you're a high quality, Not at all. upstanding American citizen. So that's why this is a good ex a, a good example, because it's so fantastical. No one would ever believe it. Let's say, though, that you were caught on camera and you walked out with something that you didn't pay for. OK. A normal person would say, okay, that's, that's, you committed a bad act. You should be punished for it. So you, maybe you get arrested for shoplifting. Maybe you, you get a misdemeanor. Um, maybe you have to do community service, whatever the punishment is, but the punishment has to fit the crime. The problem with cancel culture and, and the cancel culture society would be my friends and I get a copy of the video of you walking out of the, the store and not paying for that six pack of beer. And so what do we do? We start bombarding your website with negative reviews. We start contacting all the people who've been on your podcast and say, this shoplifting, law violating, low class guy, he's a criminal. Are you saying if you don't disavow him and you don't say something publicly about how you think Eric Mueller is, is the worst, we're going to assume that you think that behavior is okay. And so this is the mentality that takes hold. And this is where we are in our society. So then all of a sudden, even though you shoplifted and yeah, you should have to pay the, the, the punishment. You should pay, pay for the thing that you stole. You should express contrition. Maybe you even get a punishment. It doesn't mean though that you should lose your opportunity to have a podcast and to have an audience. It doesn't destroy all the other and erase all the other good things in your life. So even Eric, if you had done this thing, my view is you give a lot of value to your listeners. You're lifting people up. You're providing a service. You're, you're probably fundamentally a good person who made a stupid mistake. In my view, you should be able to move on with your life. Cancel culture though says, we're going to we're going to destroy you you can never redeem yourself every punishment should be the maximum and it's permanent and the other thing about cancel culture and due process is in a in a legal context there's due process in that you're going to get charged with a crime you're going to have the chance to defend yourself cancel culture doesn't work that way cancel culture would be we convict you and we punish you in a very draconian way before you even in many cases have a chance to defend yourself. We write you off. We throw you out. We cast you out of society. And so what kind of world are we living in where we're taking away the opportunity for people to make mistakes and then learn from them? It's just on its face. It's ridiculous. And I, I think that's why we're starting to see the tide turn against cancel culture. And as more people get educated about how bad it is, um, you know what, if a, a comedian or a, an artist who you listen to says something that you don't like on social media. Okay. So, so don't, don't buy their next CD, their album, like they're not CD. We all download the stuff, but you know, don't, 
don't support them anymore. Don't go to their concert. Don't promote them on your own social media. Why do you need to go on a campaign to tear them down and, and destroy their livelihood? It just makes no sense to me. Yeah, I, I agree, Evan. I, I think it's it's also, you know, I think the important distinction is that if something is done that is not, you know, morally or legally correct or right, like shoplifting, obviously, you know, kind of, kind of checks both boxes, shouldn't do it. It's also illegal. It's not to say that you can just do that and, oh, you know, sorry, I did that. I shouldn't have done that. And then just not do anything about it. I mean, that's, we're not saying that. It's just, it shouldn't snowball and spiral into this disproportionate punishment for something that, you know, it's kind of like, I mean, humans make mistakes. Like you just mentioned, you make mistakes on a daily basis. I make mistakes on a daily basis. It's not that, it's not that we need to be perfect, but we need to, I guess, maybe get at the core of philosophically, like how did, how did this, you know, arise or like what, what gives people you know, that power, so to speak, to, to feel like they can attack someone in that way. Do you think social media has been a catalyst in that, you know, in a major, major way to give people access to, you know, if something happened 60 years ago with a celebrity and they make some public statement or they say something, you know, they're at a comedy, you know, they're a comedian, they're at a comedy show and they say something. Aside from like writing mail, how does how would someone even get the word out? Like, what do you go with a picket sign and like you know stand out? You know, you fly to L.A. and go and stand outside their residence. I mean, it it seems like social media has made it so much easier for people to do this. It, it, would you say so as well? A hundred percent. You can't have cancel culture without social media. And so the reason you know people say, well, why is cancel culture a thing now? Well, it could not exist in a world without social media. Social media gives powerless, voiceless people all of a sudden the power that they always wish they had. So anyone has access to the same tools that traditionally powerful people, people of influence, politicians, celebrities, people living in the public eye. Every single one of us has access to the same tools. The difference, of course, is you know there is a disparity between how much power someone has even using those social media tools versus another person. And so the power dynamics shift radically because of social media. I mean, you know, maybe I have 1500 followers on Twitter and Elon Musk has 270 million. At the same time though, we both have, you know, X. We both we both can go on the platform and say what we want there. Most people have a smartphone in their pocket. They can use that phone to upload a video, to share what, what their thoughts are. We all have access to the same tools. What social media has done from a cancel culture context is it's given people who traditionally didn't have a way to hit back at others or, or to feel powerful, to suddenly feel powerful. The other reason that cancel culture is happening right now is we're also in a very in, in an age where people default to outrage. They They don't. You know, everything is very strident, very loud. Part of that also is a consequence of there being so much content on the internet. If you want to get attention, you got to scream the loudest. You got to be outrageous. And so people want to blow everything up out of proportion. People want clicks, likes, views. They monetize them on certain platforms, or they just do it because they want to feel better about themselves. And there's also political discourse that has gotten so low in this country and there's so much stratification and the extremists have pulled in their respective uh, directions. And so it's made everything, everything is political. Everything is partisan. Everything's, you know, a zero sum game. And when you take all of this together in a, in a society where people are feeling uncertain and there's a lot of stress, you, you, you mix all these elements together and it cooks up the perfect recipe for a cancel culture society. So that's why. Yeah, I, I think that it's, it's such a social media is, you know, it's a blessing and a curse. It's, it's, it's great. It's awesome. But at the same time, I sometimes wonder like, where would we be if we wouldn't, if we didn't have this, like, would, would lives be more simple? Would they be, you know, would people be more happy? It's a, it's a whole different, you know, part of the conversation. But I think Evan, as, as we kind of wind this interview down, the last piece I wanted to, to run through is just maybe a quick mock scenario of, you know, let's just take me, for example, as, as, a, as the podcast host, let's say we have this episode, I say something in the episode that I, in the moment I don't think is, you know, going to get me canceled and we publish it. And then a few weeks after, you know, a few days, a few weeks after it's published, get, start getting bombarded about what I said, 
and there's, you know, you're being contacted to, you know, dismiss it, you know, let's pull the episode down. If I came to you, maybe using you as the interview guest wouldn't be the best example here, but if I came to you as, you know, Red Banyan, as a, as a consultant, essentially, to help me get out of the situation, what would be a few simplistic starting steps that we would take to get that situation to not completely ruin the life or career of, of, of myself? Got it. Okay. It's a great question. And let's, let's stick with the shoplifting example. Cause I think sometimes having a concrete, let's say that, that you said what you said and the way that people interpreted it was, well, Eric actually said that he didn't think shoplifting was a big deal. And therefore let's do that. Eric, Sounds good. And, and the story breaks, you know, podcast host thinks, you know, theft is okay and, and should be forgiven. And so all of a sudden you're being attacked and people are saying, well, it's, it's, it's people like Eric that are leading to the videos we see online of people going into stores, flash mobs of thieves who are running out, smashing grabs. So Eric is contributing to this air of lawlessness in our country that's breaking down our society. And therefore we're going to, we're going to we're going to hold Eric accountable and we're going to go after him and his podcast. So that's a scenario that's actually not so crazy. It could, it could, and it does happen to people all the time. So a couple of things that, that I would recommend to you, if you came to me saying, Hey, Evan, what, what should I do? First and foremost is you, you should not be afraid to get in the fight and to defend yourself. And what happens a lot of times is people immediately, they, they, they hide their social media or they, they delete their account or they try to go into hiding, which is not a sustainable strategy because at the end of the day, you're going to have to come out at some point and, and running and hiding from it is, is not a good strategy. I, I liken it in the book to a turtle crossing the highway as a truck's bear, bearing down on you. If you get scared because you hear the 18 wheeler coming and you pull into your shell, what happens? You get squashed. So that's not a winning strategy. So first and foremost, get in the fight. Don't be scared. Be willing to defend yourself. You also have to make that mental click over that you're not going to allow yourself to be canceled. You're not going to allow yourself to be victimized by a bunch of people who don't know you. So then you're going to need to get your message out and you're going to need to use all the tools at your disposal in order to do so. And so that means, you know, rather than shutting up shop on your podcast, I would say, let's get a podcast out there immediately. Maybe you're going to have someone else interview you and that you can do a whole podcast on what it was you were actually trying to say and why this thing has gotten uh, blown out of proportion or misrepresented. So I would say you've got to have your core message of what it what what you actually did or said. And in some cases, people get canceled for things that they've done in other cases it's for things that they haven't done but they're just mischaracterized and this is an example where you know we're saying based on what you told me earlier you, you know about shoplifting shoplifting's bad it's morally wrong it's legally wrong but you know if you do it you should be able to 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 move past it in your life and someone could misconstrue that as you being pro crime so the other thing you've got to do is look for surrogates out there. Look for third-party validators, people who do know you in real life, who will be willing to, to come forward and vouch for you. And you got to get in the fight. You got to refuse to be canceled. You have to use all, all the tools that you have, and you should not be cowed into silence. And if you don't tell your story, other people are going to tell it for you. And you, you can't afford to have that happen. So those are a couple of of key hints. Now, I think something else that anyone who's listening should keep in mind is before you do or say something online that does get you canceled, the best way to avoid being, uh, or the best way to navigate being canceled is to avoid being canceled in the first place. And social media is, is at the heart of so many of these things. And if you do these two things, you share with care and post with purpose. You're careful about what you put out on social media and you, you pause before you just push it out and you think about how it could land and you just consider it for a beat before you push it. If you do those two things, you'll avoid many of the instances that end up getting people into a lot of trouble. Yeah, Evan, I think, I think that's great. I, I was, uh, I was thinking of a funny family guy episode that actually kind of focuses on, on, you know, cancel culture, Brian, the dog in the show, he, he doesn't do those things. You just said he tweets out before going to see a movie, like something very insensitive and then he walks out of it and went from zero followers to millions of people just bombarding him about, you know, 
how could you say that? Or, you know, it's, and it's like, you know, it's just one of those things where I think if you, if you post with intent and care, you're, you're going to, you're going to be true to who you are. And if, and if who you are is, is genuine and, and good, you're probably going to be all right. So, I mean, unless you, unless you're just not a good person, <laughs> I mean, at some point you're probably going to get canceled at some point anyway, if you're just posting insensitive things, even if you do believe them, that's obviously not okay either. So I think that it's, it's, it's a, you know, complicated issue, but I, I really appreciate you, you know, kind of demystifying it for us, sharing, you know, what you do at Red Banyan and, you know, sharing your, your expertise on the, on the show today. If someone wants to reach out and, and contact you, Evan, is there an easiest way to do that? Do you use any social media? Um, are you on LinkedIn? What, what would be the best way to do that? Yeah, uh, look, it's, I, I, I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me. Evan Nierman is my name. You can, you can connect with me there. I'm happy to connect. You can go to my company, redbanyan.com, B-A-N-Y-A-N. You can find me on X. It's just first name, last name, at Evan Nierman. You can look for me on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, you name it. You can just Google me and you'll you'll eventually find uh, all the different ways that you can be in touch with me. And, and you know, I welcome dialogue and I, I'm happy to talk with people, whether they agree with some of my feelings related to cancel culture or any other topic or or they don't. And that's okay too. But I'm a big believer in dialogue and discussion. And I just, you know, what I what I love is at the end of the day in this podcast, yeah, we talked about cancel culture and hopefully helped some of your listeners avoid getting canceled. But we focused on a lot of the positive, which which is great and and real concrete takeaways that people can use to to move forward and become the best versions of themselves. And so I just want to thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. I think this was a great discussion. It, it really got me thinking about myself and you know what what can I and should I be doing to make myself incrementally better every day? And I think if if all of us do that and we're intentional about trying to keep an open mind, trying to treat others respectfully, trying to become a better version of ourselves, well, ultimately, we're going to become a better version of our society and a better version of our country. And that's what I want. Amen to that, brother. Yeah. Thank you so much for, for being on the show, Evan. And yeah, we'll look forward to following your journey and, and catching up with you soon. Evan Nearman, the author of The Canceled Culture Curse and founder of Red Banyan. Thanks so much for rocking the mic with me today, sir. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs>